Jesus, God, man, or myth? And because it's such an important subject, let's just bow before the Lord in a moment of prayer. Worship and praise and adoration and glory belong to thee, our Father, because thou hast sent into the world thy most precious possession, Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, who for us men in our salvation was incarnate of the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the payment for our sins rested upon him with his suffering. We have been made whole. We worship because of who he is and what he did. We thank thee that the baby of Bethlehem's manger became the Christ of Calvary's cross and the Lord of the empty tomb. Give us grace to see through thy word the person of thy son. Let everything fade into obscurity. Let everything decrease and let Jesus Christ of Nazareth increase in these moments together. We ask in his name. Amen. A few years ago, I was appearing on a radio program in New York where I had to deal with atheists, agnostics, skeptics, psychoanalysts, rabbis, liberal ministers. I think every kook in creation appeared on that program (laughs) because I sure felt that way. I was there for 10 years. And one night, I was in discussion with a rabbi, an atheist, an agnostic, and a friendly cultist. And you can imagine what a jolly evening that was. Because it was around Christmas time. And everybody was knocking the Christmas spirit and the commercialism and the Christmas trees and everybody was making a buck out of Jesus. And of course, I was sitting there listening to the conversation flying back and forth. More than 11 million people listening in 43 states on NBC. And I'm asking the Lord, how am I going to put this jigsaw puzzle together? So as the real meaning of Christmas comes out. And the answer came. What is Christmas all about? What does it really mean? And the answer was. God with us. Emmanuel. Jesus Christ. Was either incarnate deity. Or the sickest psychotic mind that ever lived. Deceiver of the ages. Liar. Enemy of all truth. Master counterfeiter. Or. He was who he said he was. Incarnate life. The long awaited hope of Israel. Glory of the ages. Savior of a dying world. And when my turn came to say something I asked that question I said doesn't Christmas really depend on what you think of Jesus that's the question of the ages Jesus asked it whom do men say that I the son of man am that's the big question and there was silence I said, now you've all been talking from secular perspective. I like to speak from a Christian perspective. From a Christian perspective, Jesus Christ is either God, man, or myth. If he's God, in human flesh, he is to be adored, worshipped, and served. For he is our salvation. If he is only man, he is to be considered terribly sick, most unfortunate. And since he could not obviously save himself, he can hardly be in a position to save us. And if he never existed at all, 
And he is only a myth created by people who are trying to do good for mankind. Then we are only deceiving ourselves. And self-deception is the worst kind. And then began a discussion that went a couple of hours. On Jesus. God, man, and myth. As we went into history, we found out the historians of Rome who mentioned him. Tacitus, Pliny, and others. We mentioned Flavius Josephus, the great Jewish historian, who made mention of him. Even alluding to the fact that this could well have been Messiah. Then we spoke of the great controversies of the first three centuries of the Christian church when the church fought for her life against a hostile world. You would hardly fight defending the historicity of a man that never lived. And then, of course, there was the Talmud, which describes Jesus as the son of Pandarus, a Roman soldier, a bastard. You hardly call a man a bastard if he was never born. So obviously, Jesus was an historical person. He was not a myth. That took about 45 minutes to an hour to get into that. And then, Jesus as man. Could a psychotic have preached the Sermon on the Mount? Could a schizophrenic have walked calmly through Gethsemane to the horror of Calvary? And the discussion of the claims that he made. And then finally, to the subject of who he claimed to be. Jesus of Nazareth, every cult and every occultic group in the world says, never claimed that he was God. All the liberal theologians who have ever written say that Jesus never claimed to be God and they are all liars. That's just a simple... It is just as simple as that. Someone says, couldn't you put it any nicer? No, I can't put it any nicer because the truth. And I'm just sick to death as a scholar and a professor of comparative religions of people telling me, well, you know, Jesus never said he was God. He didn't. John chapter 8, verse 58. Amen, amen, lego humin, prin Abraham genis thy egoemi. I tell you truly, before Abraham ever came to life, I am Jehovah God. He said it himself. The Jews understood him, verse 59. They reached for the stones to kill him. What was he saying? Achya, achya, achya. I am the eternal who spoke from the burning bush to Moses. You want to know who I am? And for that, they wanted to kill him. The Jews at that day were a lot smarter than the cultists, the occultists, and liberals of today. The Jews at that time at least knew who Jesus said he was. Jesus said he was God in human flesh. That is an utterly stupendous claim. Now, of course, we're surrounded by people today who are skeptics. It's always safe to be a skeptic. You know what a skeptic is. A skeptic is somebody who says, we can never know for sure whether anything is true. (laughs) Except the skeptic. And he knows at least that's true. (laughs) You can never argue with a skeptic simply because no matter what you affirm, he can always say, nobody will ever know because everybody's information is just as good as everybody else's. And a skeptic is always brilliant until he has a pain in his stomach and he has to be operated on. And then he does not know as much as the surgeon. When he has to go to court, he does not know as much as his lawyer. Then he is willing to admit there are people that have better information than he does. The world is full of skeptics. A skeptic is a cop-out. That's the person who says, I really don't understand what's going on and I'm not going to bother to try and find out because I might get convinced. (laughs) And so the world is filled with skeptics Then of course we have the atheist I once debated Madeleine Murray O'Hare For five hours on NBC She is one of the foremost atheists in the world And we got into a lengthy discussion on who Jesus was 
And after she got through swearing, because they had to edit about every fifth word that she said, she finally got down to the place where she wanted to say something against him, and she was searching for the words to say it, but she just couldn't come out on the air and really say what was in her mind because she knew that the audience, no matter how far out they were, they would never sit still for it. And so she kept dodging around the subject and she said, well, you know, the Bible has mistakes and the prophets made mistakes and, you know, everybody knows this and everybody knows that. And I said, Madeline, here's the Bible. And I handed it to her. I said, show me a few mistakes for openers. She said, oh, I haven't got time for that. I said, you're a lawyer, aren't you? She said, yes. I said, a good lawyer always is willing to look at the evidence. I said, I assume you're a good lawyer. Look at the evidence. Produce the mistakes. Well, there were no, nothing she could produce. And I said, well, you're not going to produce any mistakes. I said, let's talk about Jesus. We broke for a commercial and she just about snarled like an animal. Talk about Jesus. <sighs> Well, we got back on the air again. I said, well, let's talk about Jesus. Well, she couldn't snarl on the air. <laughs> so we started talking about Jesus. And all she kept doing was pointing at all the failures of Christianity. She pointed at the Crusades. She pointed at all the people that were persecuted under Torquemada in the Inquisition in Spain. She pointed at the people who had been killed in religious wars through history. I said, Madeline, do you know how many people have died in religious wars through all history? She said, oh, you can't even count them. I said, yes, you can. I said, our Department of History recently did a survey on this because we knew you were going to be on the air and we wanted to check up on all the facts. <laughs> she said, well, how many did you come up with? I said, in all the religious wars involving Christianity, in all of them, knowing the population... As we now know it historically, less than five million people died in all history. She said, I don't believe it. I said, I don't care whether you believe it or not. Here's the wars. Here's the facts. Here's the populations. You go look it up. I said, but that's the fact. There are two or three professors of history willing to stand by it. I said, now, let's just take a human philosophy for openers. I said, in... Germany, two men named Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels produced a philosophy known as dialectical materialism, which is today known as communism. In the 50 odd years that that has been in existence, that philosophy has accounted in real human lives destroyed. In more than a hundred million and they did that in 50 years. Another one, a German philosopher named Nietzsche, so influenced Adolf Hitler that he brought about the persecution of the Jews on the grounds that they were an inferior race and that the Germans were the Aryan supermen of Nietzsche's philosophy. And six million Jews were eradicated on the basis of this line of reason. Ten million Baptists alone died in Russia under Stalin just because of that philosophy. Between Nazism and Communism, you managed in the last 50 odd years to wipe out 20 times more than Christianity is accused of in the last 1900 years. I said, now let's get fiercely practical and I want to address this question to atheists. If the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and if atheism is the great beneficent helper of mankind, and our universities and colleges today are loaded with atheism, don't you dare forget it. Our kids today are brainwashed with more atheism than you'll ever dream of. It's there all over the place. I know, I've lectured in university campuses all over this country. They don't call it atheism. They say we're secularists, but a secularist is an atheist because he recognizes no absolute law, no absolute ruler, no God. Let's ask ourselves the question. How many universities have the atheists built in the last 2,000 years? 
How many hospitals, how many charitable institutions have they erected? In almost 2,000 years since the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how many schools, colleges, seminaries, old age homes and charitable works have atheism, agnosticism and skepticism brought into the world? The answer is nothing. They are parasites on the carcass of Christianity. They live off us. They survive because of us. They give nothing to the world. And they take everything that they can get their hands on. And Madeline Murray just sat there looking at me. And if looks could kill, I was gone. <laughs> she said, we've done a great deal. I said, where are your colleges? Where are your schools? Where are your universities? What have you done for your fellow man? You're always talking about your fellow man. What have you done for him? I said, do you realize that 78% of the hospitals in the United States and the schools of higher learning were built by the church of Jesus Christ? Not by you. You were educated in a school founded by Christians and we gave an atheist an education. Which, of course, obviously confirms the old adage that if you educate a thief, you increase his capacity to steal. <laughs> I wish that the church of Jesus Christ would begin to stand up upon her heritage. And let's start asking the practical question, what has atheism, agnosticism, and skepticism done for mankind? The answer is nothing. Philosophy is basically skeptical, atheistic, and agnostic. I know. I was a philosophy major. I took my master's degree in the subject. Philosophy is the thing that everybody is on to today in our schools of higher learning. What have the philosophers been doing for 2,000 years? Chasing each other's tails. And in 2,000 years, they haven't accomplished anything either. They are marvelous critics of society, but they create nothing. Now let's get down to the bedrock of what we're talking about. Jesus Christ came into the world and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus Christ came into the world and said, if you're a skeptic, if you're an atheist and you're an agnostic, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you really want to be an empiricist, then put something to the test. Put God to the test. Why not try what God has to say? Around us today, we have people telling us this way, follow God, that way, follow God. I just got this today. December 23rd could be your rebirth day. Reverend Sun Myung Moon, the new future of Christianity. Come to the Schubert Theater, Century City at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. And you can learn all about Christianity in crisis and how you can get straightened out on Christianity. Who is Reverend Sun Myung Moon? He is an ousted Presbyterian from Korea who believes that Jesus Christ is illegitimate, who doesn't believe in the Trinity, doesn't believe that Christ rose from the dead in the same body in which he died on the cross. Thinks that he is a reincarnation of Jesus and his third wife is the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Somebody says, could you say something like that publicly? Yes, I can say it publicly. Aren't you afraid he'll sue you? I certainly hope he does. <laughs> That'll be the best thing that could possibly happen for Christianity in Southern California if he'd sue me because then we could go into court and prove it's true. But all over this country, you have Maharishi, Reverend Sun Myung Moon, Maharishi Mahesh Yoga. You have the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Christian scientists. 84 million people running around saying, this way to God, this way to God, this way to God, this way to God. There is only one way to God. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby you must be saved. Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about the real Jesus. The real Holy Spirit. The real gospel. And it's time that the church got up and answered the atheist and the agnostic and the skeptic and the cultist and the occultist and said, This is Christianity and that is of the devil and let's take a stand on it. In the 17th chapter of Acts, I finally got to my text. 
The Apostle Paul gives us a blueprint for how we can do something about it. Reverend Moon claims that Messiah is Korean. That's downright anti-Semitic. Everybody knows that Messiah is Jewish. And Reverend Moon is about as Jewish as a fortune cookie. Somebody says, do you have to name the man? Couldn't you just say so-and-so is going to be in Los Angeles? Yes, I have to name him because the scripture said so. When the apostle Paul came up against false teaching, he said, Hymenaeus and Philetus have erred concerning the truth. Their doctrine eats like a cancer. That's pretty blunt. At least I didn't say he was dispensing cancer. (laughs) Only poison. Now the scripture says, here's how God wants us to meet the challenge of our day. Since Jesus Christ is man and God together, since he is obviously not myth, you and I are committed to the proclamation of his gospel. So let's take a long look at what the apostle has to say about it. In the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, the scripture says, Paul was waiting for them, Silas and Timothy, at Athens. Verse 16. And his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now the audience that he had in Athens, the center of intellectual culture and of the golden age of Greece, these were the men who were the inheritors of the genius of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. Here you are talking to the great minds that forged philosophy Paul faces them, and when he looks over the city of Athens, the scripture says his spirit was stirred. You have a King James Bible circle, the word stirred, and right next to it, provoked. That's the meaning of the word in Greek. When he saw idolatry, he was provoked by it. 